Welcome to On the Brink. I have two special guests today who are going to talk about a topic that does not get a lot of attention. Well, it gets some attention, but it doesn't get a lot of excitement, and it ought to. And these are two people who actually are excited about it. I'm hoping they're going to rev you up. Uh, it's an important matter. It's open government and freedom of information. Uh, the two speakers, Miranda Spivak, um, she's awesome. She used to work at the Washington Post. She's taught. She's written books. She has a new book coming out, which is pertinent to today's discussion. It's got a great title, State Secrets, How Government and Corporate America Make Hidden Deals and How You Can Fight Back. Pretty cool. Uh, our other speaker is Mark Mahoney. People in the Capital District will know him. He is the editorial page editor at the Gazette, used to work at Glens Falls. He has won a Pulitzer Prize for his writing on the right to know open government issues. He also does a national blog, nationally known and recognized blog on issues about open government. So let me start and throw it right back out to my experts here. Why is this not an issue that generates more excitement among citizens or politicians? Mark, let's start with you. Yeah, it's it's one of those important issues that doesn't that doesn't get citizens excited. Um, I, I'm not quite sure, you know, why the public doesn't doesn't get revved up about this as much as they should be. Um, I think it's only when um, when the rights are taken away that they'll that they'll get uh, that they'll get charged up about it. But you know, as far as um, holding governments accountable and um, and checking on them and making sure that they're upholding the law. That, that's kind of a, a long term kind of, um, you know, day to day process that you have to kind of do. You have to keep holding them accountable. You have to keep uh, challenging them when they close records or when they're, you know, when they deny records. Um, you have to keep, um, you know, be at meetings when they're when they're going into executive session and challenging them when uh, they're they're going in uh, in violation of the laws. Um, it's, it's a pretty dry topic uh, for a lot of people. And it's not something that gets people revved up until, uh, you know, th that they're deprived of information that they want. And then people will get energized about it. Well, it does make it easier for politicians to ignore or even just drop the topic altogether when the when citizens are not clamoring for better behavior. So it, it just works against us in every way. Miranda, it's, also, it's also easier for people to get away with. It's also easier for government officials to get away with um, when when the public right. doesn't know the laws as well as they should. So, you know, they can just kind of flagrantly violate it. And people might not even know that they're doing it if uh, they're sitting in a meeting or if they're they've been denied a record. So, um, you know, when when people are informed about the subject, then you, you'll find that they will get more energized about it. There is that old view, that old saw that you can't fight City Hall. So when an official goes, no, you can't have that information. We're not going to give it to you. Uh, too many people just go along with that. So, yeah, it's, right. it's, a, it's a difficult thing because people. Um, because there's a process, you know, that you have to go through to get information. Um, you know, I advocate for and have been for a long time and, and other people like me uh, that they should be putting out. This information should be available all the time. They should Absolutely. Post, post the information on websites uh, that people request. Um, it shouldn't be a fight. It shouldn't be a battle. This information belongs to the public. They should have it. But but it is a battle because of the reasons why government wants to keep the information secret and, and why they don't want the public to know what they're doing. So they, okay, they make it a battle that it shouldn't be. Miranda, let me bring you in on this because you actually have spent a couple of years now talking to people who do care passionately and have seen the power of getting information from the public. What's been the difference in the cases that you've looked at? Well, you know, I think one of the biggest issues is, and it, sort of to uh, build a little bit on what Mark just said, is that people don't know what they don't know until they need a piece of information and they come up against the uh, brick wall that is state and local government um, and often the federal government. And, and then they get shocked that, you know, you can't just walk in and ask for this. And, and, and why isn't it as they say, proactively posted online, you know, contracts that your government lets, which you're paying for, why don't we just have that information somewhere? Um, and But I think until people, you know, bump up against an issue, 
where they really need information from their state and local government, which is what I've largely focused on, although the feds are far from perfect in this too. Um, they just don't know. I mean, the people that I've spent the last four years talking to, all of whom are what I call accidental activists, you know, they encounter a problem in their community, they start to try to figure out what's going on, and that's where they hit the wall. Um, and, it, you know, I have to say, I mean, some states are worse than others, but all states are bad. Um, and it just, you know, but people didn't know. They didn't know they had the right to this information. I think the other thing that's we're way, you know, we're very deficient in now is civic education. And so, you know, people don't, they just don't have a sense of their rights. You know, kids in high school maybe are taking a semester of government if we're lucky, depends on the state, but, you know, they just, they just don't know what they're entitled to get. I have found or how to go about sure. getting it. Yeah. I, I have found that journalism students at the college level also don't know the law. I sent a class out once to get uh, court records, hardly subject of FOI. Court records are completely open. Right. It was for a closed case. There had already been a conviction, which I knew. I sent them to the county office and the clerk there just didn't want to be bothered, I think, with a bunch of students. She said, oh, no, that's absolutely closed. Only the judge can let you see him. And they go, oh, OK, and came back and yelled at me that I had given them a bad assignment. You know, um, this is bad. So let me press on this. Why do government officials feel this need to hide information on things like budgets or, or criminal information that is supposed to be open? Why do they try to hide it? I think a lot of it is, I, I think there's a couple of reasons. One is fear, basically. A, that they're, A, you know, well-meaning government officials, and they do exist, are going to give away something that they're not supposed to give away, like per, some kind of hidden personnel information that generally is kept private. So they don't want to make a mistake. There's a saying in, in um, open government world, which is, when in doubt, don't give it out. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, if they have some hesitation or fear and in some states you can be sued if you give out something that you shouldn't give out. So so that's an issue. I think also that, you know, state and local governments are notoriously underfunded. You can point to state legislatures about this. And so, you know, if, are they going to spend money on hiring somebody to give, away, give out information that maybe they should give out and maybe they shouldn't give out by law? Or are they going to spend the money on, you know, something else? And mm -hmm. freedom of information is a low financial priority in most governments and not a high status job for the person who's giving it out. It's not a career builder. So I think there are a bunch of reasons. Um, you know, I put a lot at the uh, feet of state legislatures who generally exempt themselves, by the way, from disclosing yes. much. Yes. Legislatures um, are not are not subject to the Freedom of Information no. and, Act. Right. Yeah. And, and so, you know, I, I mean, they could fund this as an important cornerstone of democracy, but they don't. Mm -hmm. Even uh, Lyndon Johnson, who signed the first federal FOI law, was very reluctant to do so. He he uh, rewrote the speech in which it was announced. He downplayed it. He goes, well, there's a lot of information we really shouldn't give out. It was the most negative. Um, it, it wasn't triumphal at all about passing uh, legislation. It was really kind of regretful. Uh, Mark, locally, what are the worst cases you've seen of records that should have been given out easily and they were not they were held back um i i think uh information on um uh, back when in, at the gazette we um there was a, a fatal fire in the city and um the uh the government was they actually um there was there was records that were that were public and then when the criminal investigation into the fire took place um the district attorney's office took that information out of the public domain um, under the under the argument that uh, information regarding an ongoing criminal that could that could impede an ongoing criminal investigation um, was subject to they could withhold that but they took public information it was basic kind of zoning information or you know um, right or that kind of thing that that you would just normally look up and um, and took it out of circulation that kind of thing happens you know uh, that you know it. Um, expanding their interpretation of the law to keep information secret 
um, is is one of the things that I see governments do a lot. Um, we were, you were talking just a little bit about why government officials, you know, um, will keep the information. I think it's more it, it's fear of you said fear. Um, it's fear of being embarrassed about screwing up more than it is, I think, about, you know, that they're doing something illegal or, you know, stealing stuff yeah. or whatever. I think that, um, you know, they don't want to get challenged um, by the public. And if they, you know, release information about something or or they, you know, their discussions become public, then people are going to challenge them. And I don't you know, I think people are uncomfortable with it. I want to interrupt and remind and uh, tell our listeners that you are listening to Mark Mahoney. He's the editorial page editor for the Daily Gazette and Schenectady and to Miranda Spivak, who is the author of a, a new book about to come out on uh, using freedom of information laws to improve your communities. We'll be back in a minute. I want to remind you that you can now listen to selected segments, the good choice parts of On the Brink, uh, and another medium. And that is the Hudson Mohawk Magazine on WOOC 105.3 FM. Uh, This is uh, part of the Sanctuary for Independent Media in Troy. That's a volunteer-produced local news hour. It's fantastic. We're very excited to be partnering with them. So listen to us here or there or anywhere. We hope you'll listen to On the Brink. You can hear it on Apple, YouTube, Google, Spotify. Oh, just think of another podcast platform and we'll be there too. Uh, Also like us, subscribe to us. That is free to do. It does not cost to subscribe. Just shows you're loyal to us, which we really appreciate. Subscribers make sponsors love us. We want to give you more of On the Brink. You can help us do that. Thank you. On the Brink is brought to you by the Donna Frank team of luxury property specialists at Berkshire Hathaway Blake Realtors. Uh, I've known Donna for years. We both worked together at WAMC. She was a master fundraiser there. Uh, You should see this woman deal with people. She's got all kinds of energy. There's no problem. She lets stand in her way. Uh, She's amazing. Uh, Donna's team almost routinely, like every year, wins the prizes given out for top salespeople, multi-million dollar sales. If you are buying, selling, investing, investigating, anything to do with real estate at all, I urge you to contact her at DonnaFed, D-O-N-A-F-E-D, all one word, at gmail.com. Thank you. Welcome back to On the Brink. Uh, I want to go back to Miranda Spivak, who is an expert on government secrecy. You've you've been shut out of a lot of information, Miranda. Uh, Tell us about your experiences in Hoosick Falls and their use of of, uh, public records to find out what was happening with their water supply. It's a great story. Yeah, the situation in in Hoosick Falls is, is very, I think, emblematic of problems, similar problems around the country. I mean, it happens to be in New York, happens to be in a small self-governing community, but it could be going on anywhere. Um, So the the quick story there, of course, people probably know this in your listening horizon. Uh, A a man named Michael Hickey, who uh, works in the insurance industry, realized that not only his father had died of a rare form of cancer, but that many other people he knew in a, in a very small community of a few thousand people were, um, were very sick with cancer or had died. And he decided he wanted to find out what was going on. This ultimately led him to uh, recognize that there was a problem in the drinking water and that it had been polluted with forever chemicals and had been for a long time. But when he went to his local mayor to with what he thought was very definitive information that he had gathered over many months and, you know, read scientific papers and had consulted with the local doctor and 
um, you know, had done a lot, a lot of research. You know, the mayor was like, oh, my God, I'm mm. paraphrasing here, but um, <laughs> Oh, this is going to be terrible for the community. You know, you know, we're not going to test the water and you shouldn't do it either. And um, please don't let this get out. It's it's you know, it's bad, bad for the image of the community. Of course, I don't know which is worse. You know, people buy Mm -hmm. a house in Hoosick Falls and then discover that their water is poisoned or that their neighbors are dying. I mean, that's bad for the community, too. But (laughs) um Anyway, so, you know, Michael and then um, the current mayor um, learned to use foil in New York, and they started to get a lot of information. And one very important piece of information is that it turned out that for 18 months, the the state, various agencies in the state had a good sense that uh, the water was bad in Hoosick Falls and didn't tell anybody. And actually, it took Judith Ink, who was then the EPA regional director, um, to sound the alarm. And this is really after Michael had done all this work. But, you know, the the government sort of went into a a defensive crouch on this. And, um, you know, it was hard to get information. They're now, many years later, and lawsuits and settlements later, um, the state is funding a community based uh, group supposedly to give out information to people about how the water system is going to be fixed. But, you know, there are no minutes. I mean, Mm -hmm. there are, um, there's no recording of these sessions. So if you don't show, and many of them were in person, they went on Zoom during COVID, but they're back in person now. And sometimes they are allowing people to Zoom in, sometimes they're not, but there's no recording. That's what just blew my mind. And so, you know, when you start to listen to what the state and it's a lot of state people coming in and telling the community, oh, everything's going to be fixed. And then, you know, there's sort of no documentation or very little. I shouldn't say there's no, but there's very little documentation. But what I find just mind boggling is that they didn't record these meetings. Right. And so, you know, you rely on minutes to the extent that they exist. And I can tell you that minutes from most government agencies or councils or whatever are very, very incomplete. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's just a taste of what's going on in Hoosick Falls. You know, one of the other communities I'm looking at is in Alabama. It's the same kind of thing. There are no minutes or the minutes aren't posted or there's, you know, Mm -hmm. very little information and also happens to be, this is a sewer issue. These are classic community issues, water, sewer. Right, right. This is uh, as we are as we are doing this program. Uh, it is a National Sunshine Week, and yet yeah. there's example after example of the sun is not shining. Uh, Mark Mahoney, uh, Governor Kathy Hochul in New York has been a disappointment. She came in a few years ago, gangbusters. She was going to be completely open, also completely reform minded. Well, that's another story. Um, she was all for open records and open government. This was a good deal. Look at our transparency. She's she's not lived up to that, has she? No, and and I didn't. You know, I I was looking back at an editorial I wrote right around the time, and you kind of didn't expect her to because the politicians come in talking big about transparency until they're faced with having to disclose information. You know, whether it's about the nursing homes um, during during COVID, that information took a long time to be released, and I'm not sure all of it has. Um, whether it's um, creating. Uh, a system whereby it's easy for the public to get information. She was supposed to do that. Um, whether yeah, she, was gonna, holding... she was going to streamline the whole system to make right, it easier. Gonna make it, yeah, you right. wouldn't have to flow, just go on and the information would be available. Um, post it automatically, right. Right. Um, and, and that hasn't come to fruition to, to any degree. Um, and she also you know, the, the, the state open meetings law and the, and the freedom of information law are both lacking in a, in a lot of ways, um, mostly in enforcement and, you know, consequences for government right. officials that violate the law. And the governor really hasn't been a leader on getting that law changed. I mean, the, the Committee on Open Government is under, you know, is an executive agency. And, um, you know, the, the, she has the power to, to, to be an advocate for, for changing the laws and uh, making them stronger and, you know, uh, things like um, uh, requiring, you um, uh, compensation, the government's to compensate people for their legal fees um, when they substantially prevail in a, in a case. 
mm-hmm. um, against the government. Um, you know, they, they amended some of that. That's changed uh, somewhat um, in the in the past few years. But but still, you know, uh, public has to go a long way to win those cases and get get reimbursed. Um, and uh, so so she hasn't. It, the idea for for government is everything. The information should be presumed to be released unless there's a reason, there's some, that, unless there's a specific reason why not. Thing like you know, identifying a you know a rape victim or a child, you know, molestation case, something you know, something national where national security. Know, yeah, there are, there are no journalists media. really. I'm sorry, Mark. I want to say no journalist actually thinks every piece of information should be open. I, I don't no, think. True. Yeah. Although Julian Assange did at one point. Can I ask uh, Miranda, can I switch you for a second? What do you think of Julian Assange, whose idea was that we pay as taxpayers for information? So hell with uh, people who um, who are who are uh, impugned in this information or might get into trouble or it embarrasses someone. Everything that we collect should be open. What do you think about that? Uh, you know, I think there is a valid national security argument. And I'm certainly think that he was thumbing his nose at that. So um, as was his source. So, um, you know, I, I, I am one of those journalists who does not think everything should be open, but I do think that probably 95% of what government does should be just out there and accessible. I mean, we shouldn't even have to ask for it, which I right. think is what Mark was That's saying right. earlier. It, right. It, you know, it, it should be there. Um, so, you know, I think Assange is sort of a red herring, pardon the pun, but, um, you know, I, I just, you know, and, and I don't even think he's a journalist, so, you know, I have a lot of trouble with that. Mm-hmm. A lot of his journalists do. Mark, Mark, how about you? Were you ever a, a WikiLeaks defender before it got all complicated with rape and, you know, helping out the Russians? <laughs> Yeah, I, I think there's certain information that the government needs to withhold because it's, you know, for a lot of good reasons, for for um, national security reasons, legitimate national security reasons, which disclosed to our enemies, whatever would would, um, you know, help them in their fight against us. So um, I'm 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 not one of those mm-hmm. people who think that everything should be released. But I think there's a lot of information that that's already legally available that the government resists giving out now. You know, the. Mm-hmm. The information that they have that's already that's public, they shouldn't be resisting giving it out or making it easily available or accessible. Like um, she was talking earlier about um, about the the uh, test for the contaminants in the water. Why weren't those records just posted somewhere? Why aren't the test results posted somewhere where people can just read them themselves and and, you know, get advocates for them to to interpret the 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 uh, contamination levels uh, when when uh, the water is tested, the soil is tested, or whatever. Um, and it, it seems to me that the government withholds information that already it is legally available to people. And right. um, they just that, make they just make it problem. harder to get to it. They just make yeah. it much harder to you get know, to it. I have blasted the public, Miranda, for not caring enough about this to force politicians to do anything. Speaking as someone who saw enough here to spend kind of a couple of years of your life working on it full time, aren't journalists to blame, too? Haven't we sort of given up on freedom of information? We just say, oh, well, they'll never give it that. It takes too long. So you, you just, we don't use it that much. Yeah, I, I think that's true. I think I think you have to link some of this to the decline in local news. Now, maybe in New York, upstate New York, you guys have more. I think you do. And I think actually Massachusetts has still more local media than elsewhere. But, you know, if you go across the country, there's no watchdog sitting in there with the city council at midnight, which is when they do all their secret stuff. Um you know, it just is, it's that, that is a problem. Number one, I think number two, uh, the way news organizations are reward reporters now may discourage this kind of really routine beat reporting. You know, you go in every week and Mm -hmm. you say to the county executive or whomever, I want your calendar. I want to know who you met with last week you know, okay, for security reasons, you didn't give it to me in advance, except for the stuff that you wanted to be, you know, public where you were making a public appearance. I will accept that. But now a week later, I want to know every, you know, every person you met with, 
what they talked about, you know, how many of these people were campaign donors, which is, of course, something we would want to know. I, just, I, I don't think that there is, but I don't think that that is rewarded much in the news business anymore, at least in the orbit that I'm in, which is still, you know, knowing what's going on at my alma mater, the Washington Post. Um, you know, beat coverage is a dying uh, profession and a dying form of expertise, actually. And we, what we really should be doing is knocking on the doors of public officials all the time so they get yep. used to being asked for this stuff and they give it out it should not take a freedom of information request to get yeah. a calendar from a public official yeah. you are I, listen I, 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 I'll, I'll, I'll come back to you in a minute mark i want to take a break here you're yeah. listening to miranda spivak and mark mahoney two experts on why we should be getting a lot more documents from our government be back in a minute Here is exciting news for all pie and donut lovers out there. I count myself among you. The Apple Barn and Country Bake Shop is reopening. They've been closed all during the winter, but they're opening again on April 20th. They're out on Route 7 near Bennington. It is worth the drive, believe me. Uh, this has been a tourist spot and uh, haven for locals for, for decades. They're, they're trying something new this spring. They're going to have a series of festivals, one every month. And that's beginning with a celebration of Naples in April. And moms will get the spotlight in May. Please find out more or just drool over all the pictures of baked goods you'll see on theapplebarnoneword.com. One of our newest sponsors uh, is having a show this week, Nature Logs. It is a um, company put together by the talented writing and photographing duo, husband-wife team Scott and Denise Hackert Stoner. Uh, they take pictures of birds and insects and the landscape in general that are, they're simply breathtaking. They are eye-opening. Uh, they're beautiful. They're works of art. And they do sell note cards and prints. Uh, they have slide presentations. The Colony Public Library, that's the William Sanford Library on Albany Shaker Road in Colony, is uh, putting on an exhibit of their works right now. Uh, check it out, really. You'll, you'll be as excited about them as I think I am. We're talking about how hard it is to pry documents about the public business out of our governments. Mark, I cut you off before the break. Let me come back to you now. Yeah, I, I agree that uh, that beat coverage is so vital in, in open government uh, issues. You know, when I was a, a reporter and we had reporters covering everything, you know, I could walk into the, a county office building and I would catch them in the act. I would catch the meeting in the smoking room. <laughs> um, you know, I'd catch a committee meeting that I didn't see they announced. Um, I would sit at, you know, the board meetings and um, they would maybe maybe say, well, we want to go into executive session. And then they would look at me to see if it was all right to do. It's OK. Because I was <laughs> sitting there and, you know, they knew they couldn't get away with it if they had just, you know, if I wasn't there. Um, having reporters at meetings um, has, you know, you, you just don't have the body sometimes th these days to do that. And you yeah. definitely don't have the reporters who have the time to just wander around the halls and see what's going on. Um, so that's an important thing. And and that's why you really have to, you know, kind of draw the public in to, to be advocates for themselves because yeah. they do go to the meetings. And, um, right, right. you know, so, but if they don't know that the, the executive session, the excuse they went into executive session for was illegal. And if they're not willing to stand up like reporters used to do in the old days, and some of them still do and say, Hey, that that's an illegal, you don't have a good reason for doing that. Um, you can't do that. Um, uh, you know, th that's lost. So that's, that's, Oh God, I love doing that. That was one of my oh, best days. Those were some of my best days in journalism to stand up and say, Whoa, this is illegal. Oh, yep. the and then, um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you, you know, and you could kowtow them. I mean, and when I was, um, an editorial writer, especially in Glens Falls, um, they knew that I was going to write about it. And, and, you know, if they went into a closed meeting where a reporter covered, you know, got shut out of a meeting, they, they would know that we were going to do it. And I've had them change their minds on doing it, mm -hmm. um, on going into, a, you know, keeping a record or keeping a reporter out of a meeting because they feared the embarrassment. And, 
Um, you know, we just, um, yeah, it, it's not like it's not important to the media. It's just a, more of a challenge. Um, you know, when you don't have the bodies to, to be at all the meetings all the time and to catch them in the act like you used to be. And, um, yeah, so it's, it, it's definitely now. a challenge for sure. So the public has to pick up, pick up the slack a little bit. Um, I want to mention, uh, you know, there's a there's a, a group of citizens around the state called the New York Coalition for Open Government, and it was started right. by an attorney in Buffalo, and uh, they do a phenomenal job. Um, yep. I've, I've sat in on their meetings. They do them by Zoom around the state, and uh, and I've talked to their group, and but also just watching these people and telling what they do, and um, you know, the public acting as pu- advocates for the public is just phenomenal. So having that most, group most of the, most of them uh, to cut in there, most of them are lawyers, though they're they're not journalists. I'm always surprised at um, what I can see as a lackluster response, a lackluster lobbying by journalists for more use of mm. of uh, open records. Miranda, do you agree? And and you know, Mark, I, I do. Mark, I do. And I also I wanted to raise one other thing, which is the fees that governments want to charge people for documents and for information that is already taxpayer funded. Um, You know, I think that should be eliminated in every state law. And, you know, you should be able to get if they're not already posting stuff online, which they should be, then if you have to ask for it, they should they should not charge you for this. And I think one thing that members of the public don't know, and they get hit as some journalists have too, with you know five thousand dollar bills for right. whatever. Um, they need to argue that giving this information to them is this disclosure is in the public interest. Every state law has that exemption to fees, the fee waivers, and it's just a very useful thing that doesn't always work, but is right. certainly a tool that you know members of the public should know. So I just I, wanted to raise that. I'm going to, I'm going to suggest two changes to, um, well, to New York's, but they actually affect all of the sunshine laws that would make them more effective. One is um, if anyone asks me when I ask for a record, what is it for? They should be fined. There's no requirement. There's no reason. Right. I don't have to tell you why I want to know. Right. And the second right. thing is if, um, if you are found to Found to withhold records that should have been given freely, there ought to be an, a way to enforce that. You you get fined, you get so, punished. Nothing happens. Some, now, some states do penalize. You can. There are penalties in some states, not New York, not New York, in right. some in some states, and what, but most states, most states don't. Right. Well, that's Miranda, it allows I'm, you I'm to sorry. Wait, 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 wait. Stop, okay. stop, stop. Yeah. I got to do this in order. I'll, I'm going to come. To, I'm going to end with you, Mark. I have a reason here. M- Miranda, what would you suggest um, as reforms for most of the laws that you've seen? We're talking generically here, not a specific state. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Some, every, not all states, but most states have a deadline where they're supposed to respond to you. The federal government, it's 20 days. Um, Mark probably knows what New York is. I don't know. Um, and, you know, in uh, Maryland, where I am, it's 30 days, which is almost useless. Those deadlines should be compressed. Uh, there should be a response to a freedom of information request within five days. And the response should be, yes, we're looking into it, or we have the information for you. We're not going to charge you for it. And um, if we need more time, we're going to give it to you piecemeal as we get it, not hold it all back and give it out. I mean, very simple stuff. But those jobs have to be funded and they have to be in an agency. The governor or somebody has to tell the state agencies and local governments that this is a very important issue, that it's you know crucial for democracy, that we have an informed public and, you know, Quit messing around with this. Okay, Mark, what would you recommend as reform in New York's or or really any other any other states' freedom of information or open meetings laws? Yeah, what do I we need? I think there's a couple of things. One of them, there's a bill that's pending that they were, we were talking about the other day about uh, actually setting firm limits on how long government agencies have to turn over the information. Right now, they basically drag it out forever. I mean, years. Um, so there's there's a bill that would it's called the FOIL Timeline Act that would set specific uh, days as to how long they have to um, respond to you. Because what they'll do is they'll say, you know, um, you have five days to respond 
to our request. And what they'll do is they say, we need more time. And then they just make that indefinite. And, um, you know, we need more time to gather these records, which is sometimes, sometimes, you know, they need time to gather them if it's a, a big request. So I would say, um, but sometimes they're just using the, the delay tactics to, to kind of get people to, to lose interest or just to deny records altogether. So I would say that's one thing is to make the governments accountable for the deadlines and then make it easier for people, make it, make governments more accountable um, when they wrongly deny a record. Um, right now there's, there's a kind of high burden of proof as to when, you know, you can, um, you know, get a government to force a government to pay legal fees or whatever um, when they deny a record. And, I think any denial mm -hmm. of a record should be punishable by some kind of either, you know, a fine or a sanction or something like that. Um, if it's a public record and they are denying it and they know it, um, then there should be some consequence to that. And when it starts hitting the taxpayers, then the other taxpayers are going to rebel when they find out that they're paying legal costs because their government boards were illegally denying access to public records, then then that's when you might get people energized for it. So I think you need to do that. Um, and uh, I think there there ought to be a, a bigger requirement for, you know, you mentioned earlier is proactive disclosure, is that, uh, you know, almost all documents these days are on a computer somewhere, right. generated on a computer. Why aren't they available online? Just so download people, them. Just you know, download them. Exactly. them somewhere. Just download them <laughs> and post them. Or just, you know, when somebody requests them, uh, have them accessible and, you know, then the person emails them right now that 25 cents, they, they're allowed to charge 25 cents a copy, right? That's been in effect since I started, God, 30 years ago. So, exactly. um, exactly. you know, it doesn't, it's All never right, you have, 25 uh, cents we, a copy of page, but now, you know, but especially more. now it doesn't, you're right. No, and Listen. it shouldn't cost anything for an email. So, you know, um, that th th there's a lot of things in the, in the law that discourage the public from uh, getting information and empower the government for, um, for withholding it. And that's got to be reversed. Very good. That's a good summation. You are listening to two uh, noted experts on uh, government information and how it gets to or more frequently does not get to the public. Mark Mahoney is the editorial page editor of the Daily Gazette in Schenectady. And Miranda Spivak, who is a uh, longtime reporter, expert in government secrecy, and the author of a book on this very same topic. We always end our shows with a toast, and I want to make a toast today to honor and to thank those very few government officials who get it, that transparency really is the way to democracy, that it empowers voters, that it, um, it opens up air government, it ends corruption, the sunshine goes in and it bleaches. It didn't do that with Trump and COVID, but it does actually work in government information. And we salute that. Thank you. Thank you for being with us.